And then you can just look at the areas where there is this divergence where you have kind of significant variance and go, ah, so my issue is really that I can't process carbohydrate or my issue is that I have a tendency to the fire rate to be a bit slow. And you can follow up on that thing specifically. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I am here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson. And today we are talking about genetic insights and understanding what genes, what your genes, and how your genes have an impact on your health and your well-being. So tell me, Elwin, why are we talking about this today? Well, I'd say this is probably the first episode that we've done that's uh, maybe shamelessly self-promotional, where we're going to end up recommending... Um, our genetic service however uh, for most of the episode if not maybe all if we end up doing a part two we're just going to focus on actually understanding as you said that crucial issue uh, Chrissy I think that people tend to fall in two camps when it comes to genes so there's the kind of mainstream maybe fatalistic idea that if you ha if say your parents had something then you're never to be going to get it and there's nothing you can do and also within the kind of mainstream medical scientific establishment there's a lot of um blaming genes for all kinds of health issues and you know diet doesn't matter exercise doesn't matter supplements don't matter and so as a result of that there's kind of like a backlash i would say or a rebellion in the alternate not just alternative health world but alternative spirituality kind of new age world the personal development world and probably more that i can't think of that all say no that's not true genes play a very small insignificant part it's all about you it's about the choices you make it's about the lifestyle that you live it's about how you think it's about your relationships it's about your environment it's about your diet all of that kind of stuff right um, and I generally, up until recently, belonged to that latter camp. You know, a lot of it is like people who believe in destiny or fate versus free will. There's there's a lot of that. Um, and people who believe in, you know, the, the environment makes me who I am versus people who believe that I make me who I am, right? That I'm personally responsible for what I do and how I turn out and all the rest of it. And so that's one of the most fundamental philosophical conflicts I see certainly going on in this day and age and perhaps, you know, going back to antiquity, um, is it fate or is it free will? And so I was definitely much more in the free will camp. And then it seems to happen to me in my life, whenever I'm firmly on one side of any debate, um, I always, um, it, you know, shown by life, an absolute stack of evidence for the opposite perspective. And so that has been happening for me for six, seven years now, I would say, on this subject. And specifically on the subject of genetics um, in the last few years. And, you know, I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about it during the whole recording, so we'll get into it in more detail. But I would say I massively underestimated, in fact, how much genetics do have an impact on um, how we turn out so but that is not to say that we don't have choice and we don't have personal responsibility and so you know and that's why just to foreshadow the thing that we ultimately offer does both right it tells you what your risks are but it also gives recommendations so the risks implies that there is a genetic factor to whatever it is you have or might have and then the recommendations imply that there is a free will factor, that you can do something about it, that you can minimize your chance of having it, um, or you can you know, improve uh, the issue if you already developed it. So I think it's one of the, like this question that we're talking about today in a way is, as I said, like philosophically, one of the most Im important ideas ever. Um, you know, can I, am I the captain of my own destiny, like all the, you know, motivational gurus say, or am I actually, you know, a slave to my biology, like the very materialist scientists, you know, in this day and age say, or, and is it somewhere in between? And in fact, it's somewhere in between, but it's the discovering the details of that, that is so fascinating. What is it that, um, is kind of given to us and what is it that we do have control over? Well said. I mean, that there always is that, that part of it. And I know, um, many people it's like, Oh, it's my genes. It's just, Oh, that's just how I am. But they're, you know, there, and we do have 
power to change it. We're just not, it doesn't have to be that that's the case. So that's, that's the one part I like about it. I like about, I, I love the science of it, that it can help guide you and help support you in a way, but that it's also, you know, like you said, it's, it's not your fate. It's not, you know, there is, you have things that you can do about it. So on that note, talk to us what are genetics <laughs> yeah let's start with the basics i guess <laughs> um so in preparation for this i did a bit of like let me look up the dictionary definition and i'll give you that and then um make sure chrissy and I, i'd say really make sure i didn't you know we didn't discuss this beforehand but make sure that everything i say is really clear like the the goal of this call for me is to take a subject that is relatively wrapped in obscurity as most specialties are and really make it totally understandable for the everyday person, right? So that's often the, what I hope to do to be that bridge between the expert and the casual uh, inquirer. So, and when I looked up these definitions, it was funny because there was, there was a certain kind of circular game going on here. So, you know, it, when I give these, let's unpick it and let's make sure that we really, really understand before we go to the next topic. So what, our genes was the first question I asked. So this is a dictionary answer. Genes are sections of DNA that contain the instructions for making proteins. Now they just say proteins, but you know, we talked a lot in previous episodes about peptides and polypeptides. So them too, right? We could also say that DNA contains the instructions for making chains or complexes of amino acids. That would be the more technical definition. So they make proteins, they make peptides. Um, so they are responsible for the inherited characteristics of an organism, right? This is the next thing that it said, such as eye color, height, and disease risk. So I thought that's interesting. Again, you know, this is mainstream, this idea. We're gonna unpick, you know, how much you can do about this stuff, but, um, so this is well known, right? If you're, both your parents have blue eyes, you're probably going to have blue eyes. If both your parents have dark skin, you're probably going to have dark skin. There are anomalies and there are exceptions, and often there's a genetic cause for those as well, but that's generally the idea. And then the last sentence it gave me is, every person has two copies of each genes, one inherited from each parent. And so this is one of the factors, not the only one, but one of the factors that... Um, causes variation between siblings, right? You think, well, you know, same DNA from both parents. Why is my brother or sister so massively different from me, right? And that's because, you know, we'll talk about this later, but there is, you know, various ways that there can be variation. And one of them um, is whether you, you know, again, to make it simple, do I inherit my mother's eye color or do I inherit my father's eye color, right? Um, and there's, there's limitations to this, like height. You know, you can have two under height people. I don't know if short is an insult these days, but you can have two <laughs> below <laughs> medium height people who produce a above medium height person, right? Because again, genetics is not the only factor. Uh, nutrition is a significant factor when it comes to height. With some things like skin color, eye color, hair color, not so much, right? It, it is a lot more down to uh, inherited characteristics. Um, Okay, so now, of course, as I said, you know, the, the first part is genes are sections of DNA. So I guess then the next question is, okay, so what is DNA, right? Um, so DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule that contains the genetic instructions for all living organisms. Now, notice we have the word instructions again there, right? Instructions is really kind of the key to understanding genetics. But I'll talk about that more. I'll just carry on giving the dictionary definition first. So, so DNA is made up of four chemical building blocks called nucleotides, which are linked together in a sequence that carries genetic information. So four chemical building blocks called nucleotides. We can kind of think of those as letters in an alphabet. So, you know, like in English language, we have 26 letters. Well, most people know the idea of binary, like uh, uh, digital, right? Most things are based on that, where everything is a combination of ones and zeros. So if you can imagine the level of complexity that you can see on your TV screen or on your laptop screen or on your phone screen, just based on ones and zeros. So this, there's not just two things that vary, there's four things that vary, 
Does that make sense? So that's the different thing. So it doesn't seem like a lot compared to maybe 26 letters in the English uh, language, but it's still a lot. Like the variations of that can be, you know, well, infinite. Um, so a DNA molecule is like a twisted ladder with each side made up of alternating sugar and phosphate molecules and the rungs made up of nucleotides. So that's the end of the dictionary definition of a DNA that I looked up. So twisted ladder, this is, you know, the image that we've probably seen quite common, uh, commonly. It's called the double helix. There's the idea, the symbol that we use for genetic insights, the caduceus, which is uh, like a, a wand or a pole with two snakes wrapped around it. So that symbol goes back at least 3,000 years, um, I believe a lot longer probably in ancient Egypt. Um, funnily enough, so that was uh, known as the weapon of, or weapon, I don't know, the uh, uh, accoutrement of <laughs> Foth, who was the, uh, or Tahuti, who was the Egyptian god of um, wisdom and magic, but also education and healing and health. So, um, and he was the person who apparently according to Egyptian mythology, first taught languages to humans. Mm. So from their point of view, before that, we were apes. We were, you know, pre-language, and this god came along and taught us language. So it's interesting that going back thousands of years, the idea of information and education and health have always been intrinsically tied together. And so sure enough, um, you know, in the uh, in the... I think it's 1972, uh, this uh, pair of scientists called Watson and Crick um, discovered that the shape of it, they already knew that DNA existed and the genes existed, but they didn't really understand it much. And the big breakthrough was to understand that the shape of it was like a double helix that was just like that caduceus, um, that it was wrapped around itself. Now, the way that it kind of looks is a bit misleading. It's actually kind of scrunched together uh, is my understanding as opposed to like a neat wrapping like that but still ultimately there is that um double double uh twisted ladder thing going on um okay so then dna now the other thing that we're hearing a lot about in the news these days is rna so i'm not going to comment on uh, uh what has been going on in the news of rna but let's <laughs> just look at what is rna right so rna is ribonucleic acid. If you remember from DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So DNA is just, I guess technically you could call it dRNA and just RNA. So RNA is a, a, a simple, simpler word of that word. So dictionary definition, RNA is a type of molecule that helps translate genetic instructions from DNA into proteins. So again, we could try and think about it. Okay, so we have DNA, it creates instructions. The RNA is like the middleman that turns those instructions into proteins. So the way that I've seen it described before is that the DNA is like the book or the scroll, maybe, to use the ancient Egyptian um, metaphor. And then the RNA is more like the reader. It's the thing that actually reads that information and puts it into action. Again, it's a metaphor my, for my biochemist side there. I realize that's not an exact description, but it's it's a way of to help to understand the difference. It's the, the thing that contains the information versus the thing that decodes and applies the information. That's the DNA and the RNA. So they talked about nucleotides of DNA, but it says it again here. It is made up of four nucleotides, and that is uh, a, a adenine, guanine, cytosine, um, and uracil. And in DNA, I believe it's almost the same, but there's like uh, one variation. So um, those are usually shortened to ACTH. And those of you who are dabbled in the health world a bit more than average, you might recognize those. So those are those four letters um, that I talked about earlier. So it also says, RNA molecules can also act as enzymes, carrying out chemical reactions that help synthesize proteins. So if we go back to the definition of enzymes, which I gave quite a few episodes ago, again, if you've heard of enzyme at all in the health world, you tend to think of them as things that help you digest food, but that's actually a digestive enzymes. Enzymes have a way broader application than that. 
And I'd say, oh, I didn't look up the dictionary definition of this, but basically uh, what an enzyme is, what it does is it's a, it's a, like a chemical transformation factory. It'll turn one element into another element. Maybe by actually adding an oxygen atom or adding a hydroxyl group or removing a sulfate bond or whatever. It, it, it does some kind of chemical reaction to turn maybe one or more things into one or more other things. So that's that's what an enzyme really is in a nutshell. So we talk about a digestive enzyme, we're just talking about a chemical reaction that helps in the digestive process. But enzymes in general are one of the very building blocks of life along with DNA and RNA. And anyway, back to this definition, it says that molecules of RNA can act as enzymes so they can do that chemical reaction. So they're not only, and I often like to use the word printing. So it's like printing proteins and printing peptides. So again, it's like, again, it's just an analogy, but the DNA is like the information um, about how to make, I don't know, a lasagna. And then the RNA is like the human reading that online. Um, <laughs> and the enzyme is like the oven where these different, uh, all the cooking, maybe the kitchen, where all these different elements are turned into another element. Um, and then the protein you end up with is like your finished lasagna. It's something like that. I, I used to be a chef for years, so that's why I use a cooking metaphor. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's something like that, if that uh, makes sense. So yeah, I mean, I said I wouldn't move on to the next question until it made sense to the average person. Does it make sense yet, Chrissy? Yeah, no, it makes sense. And especially with the, um, you know, the baker analogy. Yes, that's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. <Yes. laughs> Thank you for that overview. I think that you've pretty much covered everything and giving us a, a nice basic beginning. I know we do have a lot more to go through. So can you talk a little bit more about essentially really what I think you know, what we touched on is, you know, how do gen our genetics influence our health and well-being? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, one of the things that um, we'll get into at some point is, you know, how it can go wrong. Um, but I, I don't think I want to touch on that too much in this episode. I think what is more of a concern in this episode is kind of what we're born with and what we can do with it, right? So the other definition um, that I looked up just to be, because, you know, I wanted a dictionary one and then we'll unpack this in detail, is the definition of something called a SNP. So this is the last one, by the way, I'm not gonna keep reading the dictionary all day, but this is the last definition. So a SNP, what is a SNP? A SNP or SNP, SNP is just a way of saying it. it could be SNAP or SNOP, but we call it SNP. <laughs> and SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Now, two of those words should be familiar now, right? Single, we know what that means. It means one, not, not several. And nucleotide, we've just talked about, right? So uh, we talked about the four nucleotides, right? These are the letters in this four letter alphabet that the um, all the instructions are coded in. And so polymorphism, what is that? That's the only one we haven't come across yet. So polymorphism is basically uh, a variant. That's one, the other term that's often used for it. And another way of putting it would be a mutation. So let's look at the dictionary of this definition and I'll explain it more fully. So a SMP is a variation in a single nucleotide within a gene. Again, single, because otherwise it wouldn't be a SNP, it would be a MNP, I guess, many <laughs> nucleotide polymorphism. <laughs> so a, a, a variation in a single nucleotide within a gene. Now again, don't get overwhelmed with those words. What does that mean, a nucleotide? So, so a gene is just, you know, like any book with, you know, it's just a string of letters tied together, right? So a gene is just a string of nucleotides tied together. What are nucleotides? They're just letters, right? A, C, T, H. So, um, that maybe the the way that it, the the sequence should run is a a t t a t, but instead it runs a a t t c t. And you're like, whoa, what's happened there? One of them is different, and so that's what's called a single polymorphism because it's just one off. Otherwise, it's all the same, right? And that little thing can account for all of these variations, like the ones we talked about earlier, like the skin color and the hair color. Now, not always, often there's several SNPs which will contribute to a situation, isn't always as simple as one, but we tend to look at them one at a time. So that's why we look at one SNP at a time. So anyway, I'll go back to the definition. 
Uh, SNPs can have a variety of effects, including changing the function of a gene or its gene product, or alternating the expression of a gene. So let me just go into that. Um, let's say that you uh, let me drive your car, um, and then I said, okay, um, Chrissy, I'm going to go and park your car. You'd probably be quite happy with that. But if I said, I'm going to go and mark your car, you'd be like, huh? You're going to mark it? What's that? You know, <laughs> why, why would you do that? What are you going to mark it with? Are you going to, you know what I mean? Like straight away. So one would be, oh, great. You know, one of them would be, what? So, I mean, it's a silly example, but, you know, there's so many examples where just changing one letter, uh, <laughs> I can think of rude examples, but that was the uh, most tame <laughs> one I could think of. Um, like has a profound uh, uh, impact on the meaning of what you're saying. And so similarly, just changing one letter in the DNA uh, or, um, yeah, in the DNA sequence has uh, the genome, as it's often referred to, has a profound impact on the meaning of that instruction and therefore what actually happens as a result. And this is where things like eye color can be different, but this is where your chances for disease risk can be different. This is where your nutritional needs for a specific mineral or vitamin or protein, amino acid or, or fat can be different. This is where a personality trait can be different. This is when your capacity to deal with stress can be different. This is where your tendency for towards depression or ability to overcome trauma or uh, chances of having an allergy or an intolerance. I mean, it's not endless, but there's a lot. There's so many that it, I could spend much of this episode just listing them. You know, at Genetic Insights, we have uh, over 250 currently, you know, still expanding. And the reality is that there are probably millions of factors um, that are uh, heavily influenced or to some degree or another by these SNPs, by these single variations. Um in the gene that would seem quite innocuous because often it's a very very long row of of uh, information of code i guess that's another way of looking at it um of instructions and it's just one variation you wouldn't even be able to spot it you know those kind of where they give you two different pictures and they like spot the difference and you can you know you can't even tell like because they're almost identical um so you would not be able to tell probably unless you're very very good at those games and yet it will completely you know change your you know, uh, resilience to stress or your eye color or your level of a hormone, which has a profound impact on your appearance and how you feel and how long you live. I mean, you know, these are huge things that are down to such a small thing. It's quite incredible. How are these SNPs formed, Owen? Uh, yeah, that's a good question that I do not feel um, is fully understood. Maybe it's because I don't fully understand it. I think that there are lots of theories about this. Um one of the things that so basically uh, a lot of it is down to um oh, let me just explain sorry before i ask that question let me just go back for a second with snips so and the difference between snips and epigenetics remind me of the question because i, I feel like i have to understand i have to explain this first before i can answer that question so epigenetics says that you can change your genes that doesn't apply to this. The SNP stays the same. So remember that distinction we made earlier between DNA, which is the instructions, RNA, which is kind of reading the instructions and then implementing them, right? So what you can change, and then there's also this issue of, uh, uh, sorry to skip around, of methylation, where some genes are, um, for want of a better word, turned on, so we talked about genes being off and genes being on. Another way, of, um, the, the more scientific term, is that they're expressed or not expressed. Um, and so this gets really complicated, so I'm going to try and keep it simple. But basically, the SNPs don't change because the SNPs are in that line of code within the genes. That always stays the same. So from the moment you're born to the moment you die and everything in between you will always have that SNP. But the reason why... Now, and some SNPs have a very, very, very high probability of being expressed, and some of them have a almost, you know, irrelevant probability of being expressed, like it's almost, almost never happens. And generally what we focus on are the ones in between, right? So, like, if, if you know, certain SNPs lead to certain eye colour, 
um, that's so predictable that we're not going to tell you, you know, you have this color eyes because you already know that. That's not giving you useful information. We're looking more at the one, and, and, and ditto, if a snip means you have a one in 100,000 chance of having something, we're not going to bother telling you about that either. That's maybe just, you know, concerning you for no reason. Um, what we're looking at is when, you know, maybe the sweet spot of like a, usually it's a 20 to 80% you know, chance that it will um, be read and have an impact on you. So when we talk about epigenetics, so the people who say, oh, genes don't matter, it's all about your lifestyle, it's all about your diet, it's all about, you know, what you do, it's all about your environment. What they're talking about is epigenetics. So they're talking about, look, just because you have these genes with or without these variations, that doesn't mean you have to live with it. Now, people don't say that about eye color, usually. I mean, there's some wacky people out there. So I'm sure there's some people out there claiming that with the power of your mind or your diet or something, you can change your eye color. And sure enough, some people actually do change their eye color, I believe, especially with extreme diets and stuff. So I'm not saying it never happens, but it's pretty unusual, right? Um, and but anyone claiming they can definitely help you to do it, probably not telling you the truth because the SNP is so predictive, right? But in the case of, you know, you have a SNP that, could lead to this disease state or this health issue, this health challenge. Um, again, it's it's really down to one snip, first of all. So, you know, in our reports, we, on one page, we give you a list of the most, you know, well understood snips that have led us to make the assessment that you have a higher or a lower risk of having a particular issue. And as I said, they're not all about higher, lower risk. Some of the reports are a higher or lower need for a nutrient. Some of them are just telling you, you know, you're more likely to be this type or this type, but neither is good or bad. They're just different. But, you know, a lot of them are about risk. So um, the part about epigenetics that is true is does the DNA read, sorry, does the RNA read that portion and, and, and use it to create proteins, back to that whole issue, and is that gene expressed that's the other issue is it methylated is it turned on is it active or is it so this is uh, let's think of an equivalent of this so if you think about um your computer or your phone there might be lots of windows there in the background lots of tabs but like um you know let's say you have loads of tabs on chrome like i usually do right like the one, the tab that you're actually looking at, listening to, reading, watching, that's going to have an influence on your life, right? You're going to maybe identify with what's going on. It's going to make you feel this. It's going to make you feel that. Now, the tab that you opened three months ago and forgot all about that, that's having no impact on your life anymore, right? And maybe you only had it open for a few seconds and you never really looked at it. So that's kind of an example of it, but it's still there. And at any point, you could switch that tab, turn it on, and then... It, boom, it would have a big impact on you again. You might make you start thinking things, feeling things, you know, it might have... So So it's there, but it's not being expressed. Does that make sense? That's kind of like an analogy for it. And it's not being, it's not being expressed and it's not being read by the RNA because the RNA is kind of like, as I said, that's kind of the observer. So in this case, the RNA is not reading that bit and so therefore it's not making proteins based on that bit. Um, and so that bit is unexpressed. So within my understanding of everything that you've just explained is that the SNP is the SNP. It's not going to change. It, that is how it is. That is what yeah. you're born with. Essentially, it's your blueprint. Da, 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 da. There you go. So then that RNA coming in um, within the epigenetics, if my understanding is correct, is that determined by your epigenetics, your environment and your other things, it's de depending on whether it can read that DNA correctly and whether it can express that protein or that that thing that it, or, and make whatever that is supposed to be made is that yeah that's that's true but it's also what it's choosing okay. to focus on that's what i meant with the tab thing got it got it got it can you go deeper into that yeah go deeper into that yeah an example of that is what we talked about earlier which is you know it could be expressing your mother's contribution to that gene or it could be expressing your father's contribution to that gene right so that's an example where it's making a choice like if it's something that's pretty fixed like i just said you can't change eye color you know usually right but if your parents had completely different eye colors you know what is it doing it, it, let's say if you know your dad had brown eyes your mother had blue eyes 
Like, if your eyes are blue, it's reading your mother's portion of the DNA. If your eyes are brown, it's reading your father's portion portion of the DNA and if your eyes are you know in between like mine they've got blue green and brown then it's reading some both right it may be reading certain parts of one and certain parts of the other um and 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 coming up with a compromise okay so but yeah but then that's not going to change i think that's where my understanding or you know for the clarity on the epigenetics because the epigenetics and what's being chosen to be read there that can change correct or incorrect uh yes it can so okay. what what the DNA reads can ch sorry keep using the wrong word what the RNA reads can change is my understanding and also as you said how it interprets what it's reading and that's kind of like a separate issue I wasn't focusing on that so much because I was focusing more on the SNPs but the RNA not doing the not reading the instruction correctly or the instruction being damaged because this DNA is not, it doesn't last forever, right? Like the DNA is part of the, is the, the instructions, it's within the cell, but the cells keep dying. And so, the, and the cells keep replicating, they keep dying and they keep replicating. So whenever a cell copies itself, um, there can be errors in that copy, right? But that's more like RNA reading errors as I say, the SNPs don't change. So the cells will have the same SNPs from birth to death. So that will not change in terms of um, what's being copied over. But what could change is, again, we're using like, um, uh, what, sorry, I'll finish the sentence. What could change is the RNA reading. Um, the RNA's reading of the genes. So we're using metaphors here to use to, and I know you've looked into this quite deeply as well, Chrissy. So uh, we're using metaphors here to try and understand something that's actually, you know, extremely complex. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to make it like uh, accessible <laughs> to the, uh, the lay person. But I want it to make sense. I want it to be clear. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the errors in... Uh, what is being not errors it's the variations in what is being expressed versus not expressed it's the errors in what is being read and not read and it's the areas where things are being read correctly or not correctly those are all things that can bring variations and those are all things that can be affected to some degree by epigenetics by that can vary from the time of birth to death that that will be different so your eye color will stay the same but your chance of expressing a disease or not or your ability to you know digest uh, carbohydrates or you know these things these will also change based on lots of other factors other than genes so we'll go back to my initial question question which was how are the SNPs formed um so i don't know if that is fully understood either um the basic uh, understanding of it is that it's an error from a scientific perspective or, or a mutation or a variant. Now, answer, uh, mutation, variant, error, these terms that I've seen are thrown around quite, you know, like almost like they're the same thing. Um, <laughs> it, so th there's kind of different theories on this, right? I mean, I'm, I don't even know who I'm talking to here. The, I, I may not even be talking to people who believe in evolution, right? Maybe you believe in, um, you know, creationism or, or whatever. So, and I want to respect that as well, because, you know, even though evolution is certainly the scientific is, you know, everyone says it's definite, there are, there's gaps and, you know, there's like, there's something come along and messed with our DNA and, you know, like changed it artificially. We don't know for sure. We know that every creation myth, going back to e ancient Egypt and Sumeria and Babylon and all the rest of it, all describe these beings coming along and genetically engineering us. Even the Bible, the Old Testament part of it, kind of alludes to it a little bit, although it's, you know, not anywhere near as strongly um, uh, asserted as it is within those original older texts. But so... What caused the variance definitely? I don't think people know. And that goes back to, as I say, like understanding um, the history of the universe and the history of humanity and all the rest of it. 
Um, but the, I mean, so go back to science. I'll just, you know, I'll just acknowledge that there may be more to it. But just to go back to science, I think the, the idea is natural selection. And um, as Darwin said, the number one um, trait that determines a species and therefore an individual within the species uh, ability to survive or not is their ability to adapt, right? And so this is the... Because the evolution story is kind of hard to believe if you haven't been thoroughly indoctrinated it, as as is the story of Noah's Ark, you know? I mean, they're all <laughs> kind of hard to believe if you really dig into it. But the idea that, uh, you know, at one point all our ancient ancestors were swimming underwater and at some point that one, you know, one of them just decided to go onto land and breathe air... And of course, I know science doesn't say it was decision, but the fact that we had a mutation that just meant that suddenly that was possible is a bit far-fetched, but it may well be true. I don't know. Um, when I get my time machine, I'll, I'll confirm or deny. But uh, so, so we don't know for sure. Um, but again, if we assume that mainstream science is true and correct and Darwin is true and correct and evolution is true and correct, then the idea is that just as that creature who originally had a mutation that meant that suddenly they can breathe air and crawl onto land and sure enough they could breathe air like the pure scientist believes all these things happen purely by accident right that's the if you're a hundred percent materialist you're a hundred percent scientific no notion of god or spirituality or anything you believe all this is just an accident and that there's a random variation and somehow it happened and that's just what dna does um it it keeps throwing out mutations to see if that mutation survives better, right? So in this case, again, assuming that the story is true, putting in the mutation that you can now breathe air instead of water, or even as well as water, given the use of energy and resources to be able to try and do both, doesn't seem like a smart move, you know, if if all your of all your fellow beings are all underwater, but when you crawl on land and there's all the tasty food there and there's no competition, you know, suddenly it seems like a great idea, right? So that's the the, the mutations. I mean, it really is as simple as that. Um, to answer your question, we don't quite know, right? Is it God's design? Is it genetically engineered into us by some alien species? Is it pure random chance that makes it happen? Is it the environment acting upon us? I mean, there are some scientific, you know, uh, perspectives that emphasize that more than the dumb luck. They're like, you know, back down to epigenetics because, um, you know, if we're in a specific environment, maybe that's way warmer or way, you know, higher oxygen or way higher sulfur or something, then that chemical or environmental exposure will trigger a mutation and then the idea is that there's so what tends to be the case is that a small a very small percentage of a species to begin with will have a, a mutation a variant and then and then it's down to natural selection so if the ones with a variant do better than the ones without then they will breed more and eventually there'll be more of them if they do not do as well, then they will die out. And so the vast majority of variants um, are actually not desirable, despite what movies have done with X-Men and the mutants and all the rest of it. Um, the vast majority of mutants mutations look more like, you know, Chernobyl uh, rather than X-Men. They don't make you, you know, like a beautiful person with superpowers. They, they, they're like hideous and uh, uh, dis disfiguring and debilitating and all the rest of it. Um, but nonetheless, some of them are beneficial and often they're beneficial with a given environment, right? So melanin, having a high concentration of melanin in the skin is a good adapt adaptation when there's a lot of sun. Having less melanin in the skin is a good ad adaptation when there is less sun because the melanin, as well as keeping out the harmful UV rays, um, it will also, you know, reduce vitamin D for instance, right? So if you suddenly you're somewhere that's cold, much less sun, then you're better off with less melanin. So these are, but you know, if, if you have the wrong melanin for your environment, then that's not going to work for you, right? You're going to be worse off than the people who have more and vice versa. Um, you know, 
uh, certainly in the natural world, things have changed a bit. Now we can control our environment so much. So, yeah, that's... I don't know if it's a great answer, Chrissy, but it's the most uh, <laughs> accurate one I can give. No, it makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, it does. It's like, it's the environment, you know, it's, it's uh, that can dictate which traits survive and are passed on because it's, like you said, it's that survival of the fittest. It doesn't necessarily mean fittest in a certain regard, but fittest for that environment and that surrounding space right, right around where they are at that time absolutely fit it's just not objective you know some of the species that have lasted the longest are you know like slugs and stuff like that these are not what you consider <laughs> like the pinnacle of evolution from a human point of view but they have been very 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 good at surviving within their environment for a very very long time so then that takes me to this next question which is with all the snips with a person's genetics you know is there anything that a person can do to influence the genetic that they have yeah you mean consciously so yeah, yeah absolutely so i mean we already talked about environment right so this again is almost like a philosophical point as well as a um uh um you know practical one which is you know to find the environment that suits you I mean, when I say philosophical, I mean, you know, when I used to advise people about, you know, how to be happy in a career and stuff like that, I'd be like trying to find their strengths, right? The traits that they had that they were good at and then find an environment where that would be appreciated, right? Like if you're someone who can barely deal with being with people, but, um, you know, you're really great at uh, fixing mechanical things, let's not put you in a customer service job, you know? Like it, it's just... Uh, the no matter how talented and amazing a person might be, you can always find an environment you can put them in that they will really do very badly in. And, you know, almost vice versa. I mean, some people are very, very debilitated and need full-time care and stuff, but anyone who's not in that position and even a lot who are, you can still find them an environment where uh, they can really thrive and shine and provide a lot of value. So that's in a sociological concept, but yeah, what about in terms of health? Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of um, environment, there's, right, diet is a big one, right? So um, one of the, you know, types of reports we have, I think we have, I don't know, 50-ish, maybe slightly less, something like that, several dozen reports, basically listing every major mineral, every vitamin, every amino acid, every type of uh, fat, you know, saturated fat, EPA, DHA, all the rest of it. Um, and then various other nutrients as well, like coenzyme Q10. And we'll say, you know, you need an average amount of this, you need more than average, and you need less than average, right? And so based on that, that makes a huge difference because all the stuff we were just talking about, the, especially these enzymes, but also we just talked about like fundamentally what DNA and RNA is doing is like making proteins and peptides right out of the building blocks which are amino acids and and some other basic elements so giving your body the level of basic elements that it needs is crucial for its optimal functioning right and to some degree is crucial for its even survival and so if and there are some variants that are really really massive you know one of them that was discovered i think almost 50 years ago is that you know a um, by Linus Pauling, the famous vitamin C researcher, that people who were schizophrenic needed way more vitamin B3 than the average person, sometimes a hundred times as much. Right now, that's a pretty extreme example, but there are loads of examples like that. So the idea of an RDA, like this is the amount you need because this is the average amount that people need. I mean, we talked about this in previous episodes. The RDA is just based on how much you need to not get a deficiency disease. That's not necessarily telling you what's optimal. And this actually goes in both directions. Like there are some things that I think are overestimated, like they tell you to take more than you need. That can be a problem as well. So, in, But in both cases, like if you know that you have more of a tendency to need or less of a tendency to need something, you can adjust your diet accordingly this is you know you don't even have to look at supplements right you can just go often there's not that many there's just a few nutrients that people have an elevated need for and then we can go okay what foods are naturally high enough and that makes a huge huge difference um you know the most well-known one is iron right that 
is the most commonly deficient, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, you, Chrissy, and That's yeah, me. a lot of women, especially. <laughs> uh, but there's actually a lot of people, more commonly men, who build up really unnecessarily and dangerous, sometimes even dangerously high levels of it, right? And so in both cases, it's great to know um what level you should want so that's one example right and that's probably the simplest one to understand right do i need more or less magnesium do i need more or less protein in general do i need more or less you know l-lysine in particular right now the other things that we can do are not just nutritional it's also lifestyle right so the great thing about where science and technology is at in this day and age is that we can now actually calculate if you have this SNP, if we see that you have this SNP, we can look at all the other people who have that SNP. And then there's uh, epidemiological studies that show the chances of that person having all kinds of health outcomes. And what's crazy about this to me is Number one, how accurate it is. But number two, how we're able to predict the chances of developing an issue, even if we don't understand what causes the issue in the first place. And so an example of that is anything with the word syndrome at the end means that it's not really understood medically and scientifically what actually causes that issue. So a classic one is irritable bowel syndrome. So we cannot say for sure. I know people think that they're sure, but I'm talking mainstream now. No one is sure exactly what causes it. If it if they are sure, they'll list like a whole combination of all kinds of different things that could be contributing factors, right? So, but we can predict with stunning accuracy your chance of getting it. So we don't even know what causes it, but we know that someone with this list of SNPs will have this percentage chance of getting that issue. I mean, that's quite amazing. But this is the thing of, uh, uh, you know, st like having the data, right? And then, you know, th there's a team of several dozen scientists behind this who, who constantly, are, you know, scanning all the latest research, who are, you know, doing their own studies, who are, you know, analyzing, who are putting it all together, who are checking it. But we, there's also several dozen AI engineers. And so that's, in a way, just as important or more important because they're there to help this incredible machine crunch this data and go, you know, because just imagine the scale of it, right? There's like all these different SNPs, there's, you know, depending on where you're getting your test results from, there's hundreds of thousands, there's millions. Um, then how can we then connect that to hundreds of thousands of issues, right? I mean, that's extremely complicated. And this is where, unfortunately, a lot of testing places out there are not very accurate because they're just not doing that job very well. But if you have access to somewhere that does that at a really high level, and I realize, I mean, obviously, I'm going to say that ours does, but the proof is in the pudding, right? You just got to try it and, and see with, with, with us, with anyone else, is it accurate or not? Um, the reason that I've chosen to you know, work with a company that we do is because they are the only one that I found to be significantly accurate as well as being, you know, having lots of other benefits, maybe we'll talk about later. But to, to, to crunch that data is really, really not easy. And so it's not a huge surprise to me that the company we were is the only one who really does it well. And I think they're the only one who employs that many people to crunch the data because that's what it's, you know, really all about. But anyway, once you have crunched that data, you can then go, huh, okay, so if you have this variation, this variation, this snip, this snip, snip, this snip, this snip, this snip, then you have a tendency, you're more, you have a higher risk for depression. You have a higher chance of um, having a particular lab marker result be high or low. You have a higher chance of, as I said, needing a nutrient more or less. You have a higher chance of developing this food allergy or this food intolerance or not. You have a higher chance of, um, uh, you know, developing this health issue, this disease. Um, and so that's the kind of interpretation. But back to your original question about the influence. So you need to know first, right? How can you influence something that you don't know? So that's why I've kind of not answered your question, kind of gone around the house and talk about the, uh, you need awareness first, right? But awareness on its own is not transformational. 
right? This is something that, you know, psychiatry used to believe like 100 years ago. If you just knew why you did this dysfunctional thing, you'd automatically stop. <laughs> uh, no. And it turns out it's the same with genes. Just knowing, oh, this thing makes it really hard for me to lose weight or this thing makes it really hard for me to, you know, digest fat or whatever it might be. That doesn't mean that suddenly you'll be able to lose weight and suddenly you'll be able to digest fat. No, exactly. It's like I know not, you know, <laughs> the, eating the potato chips after dinner is not going to help me get to my ultimate vitality goals. <laughs> but every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> and so the thing is, not only um, with all the stuff I said of crunching data before, not only have we crunched that data on your risk of something or your need of something or your chance of something, we've crunched the data as well about what helps. And so that's really the most important part of what we do from my point of view. Now, the analysis and the, the risk score or the need score or whatever is also extremely important uh, for many reasons. I mean, one of them is awareness. I think another one is like compassion and understanding for yourself and then compassion and understanding for other people. Oh, it really is harder for me to lose weight than my husband or wife, right? Or it really is harder for me to exercise or it really is harder for me to not snore at night or, or sleep, you know, get eight hours sleep or whatever it is that you have a difficulty with or vice versa, right? You get your reports and your husband's reports, your wife's reports, your kids' reports, and you'll be like, oh, this is why it takes them so long to calm down after they have a stressful situation or, oh, this is why, you know, it takes them so long to get to sleep or this is why they love to get up early in the morning and wake me up when I still want to be asleep or whatever, right? It's just like understanding those differences is... So understanding has a, an awareness has a lot of value in and of itself on a level of maybe on the level of stress and well-being. You can just let go of trying to be something other than what you are. You can take it easy on yourself. You can have compassion for yourself and you can do that for everyone around you and just accept yourself as you are, accept other people as they are. But again, for me, acceptance on its own is not enough. We have to also give you the ability to change. And so I already gave an example of that earlier of nutrients. But in fact, there's actually a lot more to it. So the, the nutrients thing is kind of obvious. If you don't absorb, you know, if you if you need more copper than average, then give you more copper, right? But some of them are less easy to understand, but they have been crunched and the numbers have been done. So let's say we're losing weight, which is such a huge thing, right? Are we going to end up recommending exercise? Yeah. Are we going to recommend, you know, eating less? Yeah. Are we going to recommend like eating more protein because it's satisfying? Probably. But, and then we're going to recommend a bunch of other stuff. But here's the thing. It's going to be different for every person. So exercise tends to be quite high up with losing weight. I won't lie. That's often right near the top. But like there may be other things that vary a lot. And we'll do a different video. I don't want to do it in this one. I just want to talk about, get to understanding. But I'm going to give lots of examples in an upcoming episode where I'll show you like different reports, and you'll see variations of things you hadn't thought of, right? So maybe of losing weight, it's going to be, oh, this herb might help you. It might not help someone else. And this is the key thing to understand, right? Uh, or this nutrient might hurt you, help you, but it might not help someone else. So this is the key thing to understand. Oh, I tried this. And again, compassion, right? Oh, I tried this supplement. It didn't work for me. You know, were they lying to me? Or maybe your friend recommended it because, it, you know, she said it worked for her, but it didn't work for you. You're like, did, did they lie to me? Or you might go, oh, what's wrong with me? Why does nothing work for me? And it does for her, you know, and you can just go, oh, okay. That works for her genetics. Doesn't work for my genetics. But here's this other thing that does work for my genetics that might not work for hers. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. 
To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Yeah, that I think that also stems back to a previous episode that we did where we were talking about all the different diets and recommendations or, you know, th- different food choices for people. And it's like looking at it like, well, why is it working for some people, but it's not necessarily working for everyone. And I think that's where these genetic, genetic reports can really come in and give a lot of support advice, recommendations, as you say, because they're specific to your very unique um, genes. Absolutely. And this is where, so most companies that do something vaguely like this, they'll tend to just give you one report, or at best, they might give you one report per topic. But this is why, you know, for example, with us, if you're interested in weight loss, yeah, we give you a weight loss report, but we also give you one on, do you have a tendency to high blood sugar? Do you... Uh, digest carbohydrates well or not do you tend to you know does it tend to cause an issue for you do you digest dietary fat well or not do you digest dietary protein well or not do you have a tendency to eating disorders maybe overeating under eating binging and purging which creates all kinds of issues we talked about that in uh or we will talk about that in our metabolism episode what about estradiol right the the hormone estrogen if that tends to be elevated in the person then that means that their body will tend to hold on to fat specifically. So that's something you want to be aware of. What about your tendency to hypoglycemia? If you tend to have low blood sugar, then you're going to want to eat more often. Uh, What about low mood, right? A lot of people, when they overeat, is because they're depressed. So we need to look at that. Do you have a tendency for that? What about metabolic rate? Why is it that your friend can maybe binge and eat loads and loads of food and, you know, never diet, and yet somehow they always keep the weight off and you're barely eating, you know, a stick of celery for lunch and you can't get it off? Maybe it's your metabolic rate. Uh, Oxytocin is another thing I've talked about in previous episodes. So that's a feeling of satiety. If you tend to have low oxytocin, you're going to tend to feel less satisfied. You're going to tend to want to eat more, especially fatty foods in the case of oxytocin. Um, what about psychological trauma? There's a lot of evidence that people who have kind of PTSD, like complex PTSD, one of the things they'll tend to do is overeat uh, to try and, again, squash down the feelings. That's something that needs to be known. How do you respond to saturated fat? There's a big thing, you know, what's better for you? Is it plant fat or is it animal fat? Turns out, again, it depends on your genetics. Uh, what about your levels of serotonin? What about your levels of stress uh, when you're you know, when you, uh, a lot of people who want to raise serotonin, they'll tend to do it by um, eating more carb food. Whereas if they want to, re- uh, if they want to raise um, oxytocin, they'll tend to eat more fatty food. So depending on what cravings you get, or if you tend to see, have tendency to stress, which we have another report on, then you might be more tempted to eat a lot of salty foods, you know, so it's another example. Um, if, uh, what about underactive thyroid? You know, we'll talk about this soon if we haven't already. Um, in the order of episodes, I'm not 100% sure, like fire, underactive thyroid absolutely will lead to weight gain and, and inability to lose weight, no matter what you do with diet and exercise. Um, you know, there's visceral fat, that's the fat that you have in between your organs, that's the worst kind of fat, if you have a tendency to hold on to that. Um, there's A1C, which is, you know, your overall blood uh, sugar score. And then I've got testosterone in there, which especially for men more, if they have low testosterone, they also tend to hold on to body fat because the estrogen is high in relation to testosterone. So as I say, our weight loss report is great. It'll tell you your tendency to have high weight and low weight and it will give recommendations. But if you can see if you get the full picture, like with a collection like that, you'll know all the factors that might contribute to it. So, and you can start looking at influencing all that stuff. Now, if that seems overwhelming, again, Most of it, maybe you won't have to influence, right? It might just say, "Eh, you don't have an issue of hypoglycemia. You don't have an issue of your thyroid. You don't have an issue of stress. You know, your thing might be low testosterone or your thing might be, you know, that you don't, you don't process fat very well. So just stop eating high fat diet. Again, I realize that some people do better with a high fat diet, right? Lots of people lose weight on a ketogenic diet. That's awesome. But there are those few who don't? And maybe you have the opposite experience. Um, so yeah, so that's like an example of 
how you can influence it. Now, the recommendations will tend to be nutritional. Um, they'll tend to be dietary and they'll tend to be lifestyle. So we don't recommend any drugs. That is in the realm of a doctor, right? Um, even if we recommend that you have a high, well, even if we tell you you have a higher risk for some kind of medical issue, we'll never say, you know, to just get treatment. We'll say, go to a doctor and find out if you actually have it, right? So our recommendations are purely going to be on the level of uh, dietary and lifestyle and supplement changes. Um, but, you know, that's uh, a lot of our customers don't even like going down the medical route. So I guess it's preferable uh, to some people. And But, you know, I recommend you also go down the medical route go and check with a doctor. And these recommendations are the things that come in the report. Those are things you can implement immediately. Yes, that's another benefit. Absolutely right. Yeah, you can, if you already have, uh, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, if you can access your results straight away, which a lot of people can, um, then you can literally, you know, within a few hours of watching this episode, you could be already implementing what you've learned to get benefit. And I guess, you know, the other benefit, you know, we talked about can it influence your genetics? And yes, but this also helps you not just work out what's right and wrong, but also for you, based on your unique genetic profile, but also what to prioritize, because that's the other thing, right? So yeah, if you're trying to lose weight, you might be like torn between, oh, you know, should I go like high carb, low fat vegan, like my friend, or should I go like keto, low carb, high fat, like my other friend? So there's that dilemma, but there's also the issue, you know, should I prioritize uh, a fitness regime? Should I prioritize changing my diet? Should I prioritize, you know, getting a supplement? Should I prioritize trying these herbs? Should I prioritize meditation? Should I prioritize better sleep? You know, should I prioritize losing stress? There's all of these, should I, you know, check out my thyroid? Should I check out my estrogen? There's all these potential things. And so it can help narrow down because let's say you you know you have something like twenty reports ish something like that like in the 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 weight loss collection, you could you won't have like a high risk of all of them you know so with a lot of them you can just go or you won't have a high need for everything right a lot of things you'll just be average <laughs> where it's not particularly <laughs> pressing and then you can just look at the areas where there is this divergence where you have kind of significant variance and go, ah, so my issue is really that I can't process carbohydrate or my issue is that I have a tendency to the fire rate to be a bit slow and you can follow up on that thing specifically. So in terms of, you know, those are the reasons why I think it's beneficial um, to help influence the situation so much because not only can it help you know what is and isn't the right thing to do, but it can also help you prioritize it. So Owen, what's required to access this information on these genetic uh, predispositions, weaknesses, or strengths, as you've said? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I wish it were just about, uh, you know, clicking a button and uh, I could just give it to you. And sometimes it can be almost that simple, but it really depends. So obviously, if we're basing risk goals and recommendations on your genetics, we need to know what your genetics are right? So we need that. So there's two different ways that you can do that. Number one is if you've ever done any kind of ancestry report before, like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, um, and you still have access to that or can get access to that, maybe via an email address or something like that, or a phone number, or you can call them and, you know, find out how to get access. If you have any way to access that because you've ever done the test before, then it is super easy. All you gotta do is go into that platform and you just look up in the search field and I think we provide instructions for that as well um, if you wanna buy with us first and then do it. Um, and you go to export data and you basically just download this document. It's just got loads of stuff you're not gonna be able to read, right? Lots of DNA sequence stuff. So you're just downloading this file. Don't open it, don't look in it, don't worry about it. Just download it from whoever that is. And then uh, you upload it to our system and then we do the magic on it. We do that number crunching, the AI goes to work. And because it is such an immense complex process, it's not, you know, uh, okay, press the button, ding, 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 ready. It takes a few hours, right? It, it, as I said, the amount that it's crunching is amazing. But what you get at the end of it, you know, is mind blowing and it's totally worth it. So that way it could take a few hours. If you um, have not already done that, let, let me just tell you what it involves. 
So in order to get your DNA information, it's actually pretty easy compared to most testing. You don't need to go anywhere. You don't need to be have a needle jabbed in you or collect anything disgusting like a stool sample. All you have to do is you order a DNA kit and you get sent this, um, along with instructions and all the rest, you get sent this little test tube with a lid kind of thing. It's actually plastic, but whatever. And you spit in it a bit up to a certain level. So you just put your saliva in there. Make sure you haven't just eaten all that stuff. You know, the instructions are with it. And then you send that saliva back off to the lab. And then they will do that thing of creating the big spreadsheet with all the uh, the lines of uh, uh, code, as it were, which is your code. Um, if you want to do that with us, we can absolutely provide that. Um, when you add any of our collections to your car, you will be offered, do you need a DNA kit? And you can add that if you need it. I'm not attached to you doing that with us at all, though. If you would prefer to do that with another company like Ancestry or 23 Me, because you also want to hear what they have to say and you want to compare them to us, I'd love you to. I, am, I, I feel 100% confident that uh, we will stack up very well against anyone else that you may try, you know, and get the uh, results from first. So we have no attachment to that. Absolutely feel free to... Go and get your raw data from someone else, by all means, if you'd like to compare them to us, if you feel better about uh, them doing it than us, whatever. If you're all in and you just want to do it with us and you want to make it as simple as possible, then yeah, do it with us. Um, you can order it with us. We'll send you a kit. You send it back. And then it, you'll, you won't have to export anything and all that. It'll just All your results will just automatically show up in your members area where you can access all your information. That's obviously, you know, password protected and all the rest of it. And then, um, yeah, you know, it, it's really as simple as that. In terms of uh, how does the lab get the information, I can't even answer that for you in any <laughs> degree of uh, complexity, uh, Chrissy. I mean, you know, basically they are, you know, doing the same job that the RNA does. They're, they're getting it and they're reading it, right? It's already been sequenced. The whole human genome has been sequenced. So they just, they get it from the cells which are in your saliva and then they they read it and then they take what they read and put it on the put it on the spreadsheet thank you for that thank you yeah and the, the instructions are pretty pretty easy you just follow them through it's, it's not a not a difficult process at all so you and i have been talking for quite some time and you have been on a discovery for your own health and wellness as as we've been discussing in the podcast and hence bringing it you know to this platform and sharing this information and i want to ask you from your genetic insights uh, wellness reports what was your or what do you think was your most important or valuable discovery oh most important and valuable yeah that's an interesting one so are we talking health wise or well being wise? I think because let's I go both. That... I think let's let's look at both. <laughs> okay. Um I know we're probably already going over time here, but we said we'd do a part two if necessary. Um yeah, so okay. So health wise, I guess this is a bit easier to explain. Um as I've talked about in other videos, I believe, by the time this one comes out, and but I'm happy to say it again, one of the biggest breakthroughs from my health when I was just feeling awful and nothing was working and many problems I'd had for a long time that had been less suddenly got way worse and a bunch of new problems arrived and long story short I discovered that one of the fundamental issues is that I had very high levels of lead and this was not found in my hair which you could always say, well, maybe it's in the tap water or something. This was not even found in my urine because then you could say, well, you know, you were peeing it out, but it doesn't necessarily mean you had a lot of it. This was in my blood. And so when you have a poison like that in a high level in your blood, that means you have a poison like that in your high level in your brain, in your kidneys, in every organ and every system in your body. It's really, really not good. Um, and something less dramatic, but, you know, ditto was also true with uh, mycotoxins, maltoxins. But the thing that led me to want to investigate in the first place is that I discovered that one of... So I talked about everything other than this, I think, actually. We talked about lab markets, talked about nutrients, talked about health types, health risks, personality. Uh, but we haven't talked about... We also do do reports on the most common toxins, specifically the heavy metals. So lead, mercury, uh, arsenic, cadmium, uh, maybe another one. 
And my, it turned out my ability to detoxify and remove lead from my body was significantly less than other people. And this was like extremely helpful information. And then, you know, when I did the blood test to confirm it, it, it basically, you could easily, like if I were a person of hyperbole, I could say, oh, that explains everything. Like I went to my medical mainstream normal GP over here and who had been at a loss to explain any of what was going on to me. And I showed him those results and then they retested it to make sure it was real because they don't trust, you know, alternative companies. And sure enough, they saw it was equally high. And I go, could this be causing all my symptoms? And he goes, yeah, might well be. Do you want anything you can do to help? <laughs> no, not really. But to be fair to him, there's not a lot, not a lot you can do with lead toxicity, except for in the very extreme cases. Um, part of the problem is it just it gets stored in your bones and slowly released into your bloodstream. And there's not a lot you can do about it. But anyway, if it hadn't have been for knowing that I have that tendency, I might never have tested for it in the first place. So this is one of the things. Do not see any of our reports as a diagnosis. Just because you've got a high risk of something doesn't mean you've had it, doesn't mean you do have it, and doesn't mean you'll ever have it. Have it. What it does mean is that it might well be worth testing for, right? At an age-appropriate time. Obviously, if you're 20 and you you know, have a report that says you have a high chance of osteoporosis, it does happen to 20-year-olds, but very, very rarely. So if you're not experiencing any pain and any issues, probably not worth testing for, right? But when it comes to something, you know, that is age appropriate, that could well be the case, then because testing often is a lot of hassle and a lot of money. So I'd rather hassle trying to get your insurance company or your doctor or whatever to, to order it and to pay for it. Or, you know, it's uh, a lot of money to pay for it to do it yourself privately. So just testing everything that might be wrong with you or testing everything that you might be able to improve is ridiculously expensive. So whereas our tests uh, sorry, our reports are not, they are ridiculously cheap. So they can help you to identify wh what are the factors that it would be a good idea for me to perhaps test. And so for me, this lead was one of them. So that was a game changer. Um, my lead when I first did the test was something like 70, 20, no, 27.5 micrograms per deciliter. The high end of the range it should be equal to this scale was three. And really, you don't want it above one. And once it gets to 45, according to the World Health Organization, that's where you might consider hospitalizing a person and doing aggressive chelation therapy because it's so poisonous. So, and, and anything above five is extremely dangerous in a child, could learn to, could lead to, you know, not growing properly and um, all kinds of uh, serious, serious issues. So, this was not life threateningly terrible, but it was not good. And, I've now got it down to six. It's still not great, but this is the problem with lead toxicity. Anyone watching this, you got some advice, put it in the comments. I'm happy to try it, but it is not easy to deal with. But anyway, I'm so glad I found it for two reasons. First of all, back to the thing, compassion and acceptance, right? I could say, ah, this is why I do so much for health and don't feel as good as other people. Second of all, when you have high lead in your blood, everyone's always like, where does it come from? Is it in your water? Is it in your food? You know, try all that, test all that, and it's not that. And then it turned out, oh, your body stores it in your bones. It The half-life is something like 20 years. You might have had it for a long, long, long time, right? Like over a decade, maybe way longer even. Especially if you have a genetic tendency <laughs> to break down lead less well. Now, unfortunately, we can't tell you how much less well you have a tendency to break it down, but I suspect that it may be significant. Just like I said with, you know, some people need 100 times as much vitamin B3 as other people. I think there's a probably a big difference between how well I can break it down and other people, which is why it just kept building up more and more and being put into storage more and more. So that was a practical one that was a big deal for me. Um, on well-being level, I would say understanding my um, comp gene was um, really interesting. And so the comp gene is um, one of the primary, like almost everything, all the reports are like about an issue or a goal, right? Like weight loss or a, a sinus infection or UTIs or osteoporosis or, or something, right? 
Um, in the case of um, uh, Compt, that's one of the only genes we talk about because it's so important. So it's a gene and it's an enzyme as well, right? So what Compt actually does to simplify it is it breaks down stress chemicals. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, and also dopamine. Now, if your Compt is fast, it breaks down stress chemicals quickly. If your Compt is slow, it breaks down stress chemicals slowly. So these variations where sometimes things are broken down more quickly, sometimes more slowly, there are a lot of factors that can influence that, like how much of the thing that you've got, how much of the nutrient you've got to support it. Um, but one of the factors is genes. Some people's naturally run quicker, some people's naturally run slower. And so that's what we have in our little reports. We have medium, fast, or slow. Now, if you're a fast comp person, what that means is you'll break down stress chemicals quickly on average or other lifestyle and environmental factors aside. And so you will tend to deal with stress well. If you're in a chaotic environment, if you're in a war zone, or if you're in an emotional equivalent of a war zone, you'll be okay. Why? Because as fast as your adrenal glands are popping out stress chemicals, you're breaking them back down again. And as soon as the drama's over, you're fine again. On the other hand, if your Compt enzyme breaks those stress chemicals down slowly, then you can have an incident, a stressful influence incident, and then a few minutes later, you're not better. You're still stressed. A few hours later, you're still stressed. A few days later, you're still stressed. And especially if this stress is extreme or if it's like you know intermittently high or even if it's continual, you're just getting more and more and more and more and more stressed until the point you're uh, you're a nervous wreck, right? You're anxious, like you're you're jumpy, like uh, right, like uh, you're in the right state as I used to be. Um, and so the speed that we, so you could break down stress chemicals is huge. So finding out that I was not good at breaking down stress chemicals genetically was really, really helpful because it helped me to just go, oh, it's okay that I am that way. And, you know, because I always used to look up to people who were like unfazed, you know, mystical, like your James Bonds, bullets f <laughs> flying all around you and you're, making jokes, you know, <laughs> sipping martinis. Um, I always used to think that was awesome, right? I wished I was so cool and unflappable, but I'm not. Um, and, and so to understand, ah, okay. Now to understand that's just the way I am is one thing, but here's a really interesting thing. One thing that I'm good at is focusing. And so it turned, and also just being happy, especially when there's not much going on around me. I don't get bored very easily. So it turns out that, as I said, comp doesn't just break down nor epinephrine and epinephrine, the thing that makes you feel anxious and upset and stressed. It also breaks down dopamine. Dopamine is the thing that makes you feel motivated, makes you feel passionate, makes you feel enthusiastic, and it gives you m uh, mental clarity and, you know, energy, enthusiasm to do stuff. And it turns out that those people I'd been envying, they've got their own problem. They keep breaking down dopamine too quickly. And what that means is they only feel okay if they're in the middle of a war zone. If they're not in the middle of a drama or a crisis, then they feel bored. They feel unable to focus. They are much more likely to have ADD or ADHD. Um, they get extremely easily distracted. It's very hard for them to get something done. And it's very hard for them to feel anything. They just feel flat and unmotivated unless everything is chaotic around them. And so I was like, ah, okay. Like there's an upside and a downside. And this is often called the, uh, I call it the wizard's wa uh, warrior gene, right? The wizard is better off, you know, they can, they can be fine on the top of a mountain or on their own, like happily plodding away, you know, uh, doing whatever, reading books. Whereas the warrior, they have to be in the midst of battle. Otherwise, they're not happy, right? So it's not really that I, I, I realized in this particular case, it's not really that I was inferior to this person who I admired and wished I was like. I was just different, right? The, the, there's a benefit and a cost of both. So that's 
one example of many. Um, and, you know, everyone has their own issues. That was something that I wish that, that I was, you know, but there are other examples where people realize, oh, you know, there is a downside to being this thing that I think that I thought that I wanted or that I wished for. So, yeah, so those are the two examples of two big ones for me. And then I guess it also puts into perspective whether something's attainable or not, of thinking that you could be that individual that can handle or be in that war zone and go, well, actually, no, why would I put myself in that environment that's not right for me? Absolutely, exactly. Yeah, because that can be the thing. And there's a little bit of truth to that, like to get outside your comfort zone, right? Like someone who's only ever happy in a chaos maybe should be in quiet, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, um encouraged to sit and meditate or to just reflect and ditto someone who you know is uh against that to the point of being agoraphobic should be encouraged to go outside and maybe do some public speaking or, or a team sport or something so there's a bit of truth to that but not expecting them to be able to deal with it as well as a person who is naturally able to deal with it right so yes they should be maybe encouraged to step outside their comfort zone in either case but let's not expect them to handle it as well as someone who's naturally happy in that environment. I think that's the key. So, Owen, if anybody has any questions, where should we send them to? Where should they go to find out more? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so for simplicity, if you go to geneticinsights.co, that will uh, send you or it should send you, I believe, straight to the page where we offer our like complete all access suite called the, the uh, Limitless Collection, where you have access to every report that we've uh, ever created um, and every report that we will create. This is like a uh, we can't we're not allowed to say lifetime, but this is an unlimited membership <laughs> with an unlimited amount of reports. Um, at a very, very reasonable uh, low price. Um, and we'll probably put, uh, I'd say, Chrissy, a discount code underneath this for those who've watched this far to thank them for that and reward them for that. Um, if you're more interested in finding out about a specific, a specific issue, uh, like, you know, you just want to see reports on weight loss or you just want to see reports on... Uh, how to increase energy or emotional well-being or um, anti-aging or whatever, then uh, we'll put maybe we'll put those examples. We'll put links to it again underneath here, Chrissy. But uh, the other thing you can do is just go to fearyounger.net and you'll see um, on the, the kind of menu thing at the top, one of the categories of genetic insights. And you can see like all the categories that we have available uh, at this time will be there. So you'll see all access limitless membership at the top and then allergies and anti-aging and blood sugar. So like the whole uh, collection will be there. You can select any of them from there. That's fantastic, Ellen. Thank you so much. We're at our time for today. But uh, next time, we're going to carry on this conversation. We're going to go deeper into examples from some of your other clients, how to read reports, and also some troubleshooting if anybody might have any questions or queries on that. So again, Ellen, thank you. And um, to everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon for any notifications. Put your questions in the comments remember just to communicate with us ask us any questions and we can help bring that to you here today and we will see you next time i hope you enjoyed that episode and if you did i want to tell you about a way that you can support the podcast while also getting great deals on high quality supplements that ellen and i personally use and that's feel younger what i love about feel younger is that they have great quality products with minimal fillers at a very affordable price you can call their customer support team 20 hours a day seven days a week and in my experience they're very helpful and friendly. And the thing I love most of all is the amazing descriptions that Elwin has written about each product category on that topic. And each product has so much education on it that I've actually learned more from reading the descriptions than I have from a lot of articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, use promo code RejuvenateMe for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order using promo code RejuvenateMe at feelyounger.net.